nobody understands until they come to Kiev just how beautiful it is. I'm just, I was just picturing you turning up in London and asking some stranger where to go and eat. <laughs> I, I suspect they'd be really rude. <laughs> really? I've always told um, people who come here that they really need to go to Chernobyl. If you ask, you know, Brits, what do you know about Ukraine? Chernobyl would be one of the first things. Hello world, it's Kyiv, not Kyiv on the line. My name is Polina Bochuk and this is my friend and fellow Tatiana Hajduk. And today we have an incredible guest. Uh, Her Excellency, Madam Ambassador of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to Ukraine, Melinda Simmons. Madam Ambassador, it's such a pleasure and honor to see you in Kyiv, not Kyiv. Lovely to see you both. Fantastic to be interviewed by two women. Thank you very much. We'll start traditionally with my with a set of my most favorite questions, with a set of personal questions. I know that uh, you are serving as ambassador uh, of uh, the UK to Ukraine for two years already, and uh, you have received the great legacy of uh, Judith Kov. Yeah. Uh, but for sure, you have done so many uh, things uh, for the improvement of the Ukraine and UK relations. So, what uh, achievements would you like to highlight for these two years? What are the most? Oh gosh, there's so much because the relationship I think has grown stronger and stronger. <clears throat> but if I had to highlight one thing, it has to be the uh, trade deal that was signed in the UK. For one thing, that was the, I think, the big thing that differed from Judith's time here. Mm -hmm. Of course, we were in the EU when Judith was there and, you know, now we've left and we needed to sign this trade deal. But also we wanted to use it to express opportunity, opportunity for partnership. I really believe that when Judith was here, Ukraine was more of a recipient country of assistance from the UK, you know, because of the war, of course, among other things. What the trade deal did was not just say there are opportunities to sell and buy, there are also opportunities for us to learn from each other. So for me, that was a really important moment that we were working with Ukraine as a mature democratic country that knew things we didn't, and then we knew things Ukraine didn't. And this was about sharing that experience. I think that's why it probably stands out as my proudest moment. So Ukraine is changing from the recipient to a partner, right? Yes, yes. Well, nice to hear that. Your service in Kiev fell mostly on a troubled COVID times. Uh, how has this beautiful city around us, Kiev, helped you to stay uh, optimistic? Uh, being so far from home, so having, I believe, a whole bunches of uh, diplomatic work, which is a crucial one. Do you have a so-called uh, places of power here in Kyiv, in your new home? It's a great question because of course the answer is nothing could really help in, in the lockdown in terms of my situation which was that I was separated from my family and I think that for many and particularly diplomats and people working overseas the issue was not so much the separation but just not knowing what was coming. I mean I think we all found that the hardest of all in uh, February, March last year. We just didn't know how long that was going to go on. So uh, I didn't see my husband for six months, which is the longest we've ever been apart. We've been married a long time, so that, uh, that was really hard. And nothing can really help with that. But I had the huge, I think, advantage, both of living in a very big building. By the way, being alone in a big building is not nice, but living in a big building when everybody knew that you needed to be somewhere with space so that you could talk safely. This was a huge advantage. So within three months, I converted this into a business centre. Stopped being, you know, entirely about where you live and became also a bit about a being about where you work, which meant that I could start welcoming people here. So that was great for me personally, of course, but also fantastic for work that suddenly people felt there was a place they could go. So this alone was a huge advantage. But the other thing is, and, and as all our visitors say, I have a visitor who's arrived here this morning for the first time, never been in Ukraine and has the same reaction that I had. Nobody understands until they come to Kiev just how beautiful it is, really. It's, it's almost a shocker how much of a secret that is. So for me, you remember back last year when you were only allowed out once a day, mm -hmm. like just in the first lockdown, you're only allowed to take your walk once a day. And you know, I live near the Lava and this is by the water and I would walk down to the water's edge and look across at Trukhanov Island and think, how can you not be made to feel happy really mm -hmm. when you look at how green it is and you can see the river just the view, really, of uh, where Kiev is situated would make me feel good. 
Very nice. Your team told us about um, uh, your schedule and it is very busy and very full of hundreds Sorry. of meetings with uh, the representatives of business sector, of uh, public sector and also of yeah. the civil society. Uh, whether this is the communication at the highest level or just in a very informal setting, do you spot any similarities in the behavior of Ukrainians and British? Is there anything similar? So I, I get asked this a lot, actually, and, and I've concluded that I don't really like talking about cultural characteristics mm -hmm. because the truth is, in the end, everybody wants the same thing. And mm -hmm. I think COVID really showed us this. Everyone wants to keep safe, to be healthy. Everyone needs to be able to make money and look after their families. In these things, there is nothing different between Ukraine, Ukrainians and, and British people. The thing that stands out for me most uh, among Ukrainians, no matter who I talk to, I met with a group of women, for example, this morning as part mm -hmm. of Defenders Day who work on the front line. Each one of them, brilliant. One of them who does demining and one of them who is uh, one of the first female generals and someone else who works in the Navy. I spoke to them this morning, was struck by the same thing as when I speak to um, business people or I travel the country mm -hmm. and I talk to people in the village. It's the same sense of non-negotiable determination to define the direction of their country. That's incredible. And to a degree, you see that less in the UK just because we have something that you don't yet have. We have this long tradition of strong institutions. Mm -hmm. I was born into that. I, I didn't spend my life worrying about the strength of institutions that would protect me and my family. I already I was lucky I had that. This country, 30 years old, still building them. And I'm always struck by just how knowledgeable, it doesn't matter who I speak to, everyone knows stuff, everybody's got an opinion. <laughs> and everybody is prepared to fight for it. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, that literally means fighting, as you know, the number of people who took off to the East in 2014. I still can't believe it, really. I travelled really far west and southwest, met people who went off to the East, never been there before until 2014. But not just fighting, but also exercising their democratic right, which is also a form of fighting, right? Voting or themselves standing for election. That engagement, I think it's extraordinary. And I think it's Ukraine's single biggest strength. Well, wow, impressive that answer. Thank you very much for it. Um, if I came to Britain as a tourist, uh, I believe that the first thing I would probably do is to ask someone local where to go, what to eat. Uh, can you advise me a couple of nice pubs uh, or nice places to have dinner? When you receive guests from uh, Britain here in Kyiv, do they ask you the same? I believe they do. So what do you usually recommend them? Where to go in Kyiv? Actually, you know, I'm just, I was just picturing you turning up in London and asking some stranger where to go and eat. <laughs> I, I suspect they'd be really rude. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, Brits, Brits need time to get to know people, I think. Oh. But I'm sure in the end they would tell you where to go. But no, um, uh, so I haven't had many visitors, personal visitors, of oh. course, because of lockdown, such a long time of not really being able to travel between UK and Ukraine because of quarantine, although good news, that's just changed, which is great. But so I expect now I will have more visitors. But those that have come, of course they ask. And <clears throat> I tend to um, try to introduce them to the things that most obviously define the city and which, of course, are so kind of gaspingly extraordinary just in their own right. I live up the road, of course, from the Motherland statue mm -hmm. and the park with the view and the lava, it's extraordinary. And, so people tend to take all that in and they are always taken aback by, by the sheer beauty, but also the history of it. I've always told um, people who come here that they really need to go to Chernobyl. I totally get that that is a uh, cliche in mm -hmm. the UK. If you ask, you know, Brits, what do you know about Ukraine? Chernobyl would be one of the first things. But I've come to believe that it's one of the most important things you can do if you're here. Mm -hmm. Firstly, because it's so near and therefore that's why it's important to understand the, mag the, the magnitude of a disaster that big, so close to a metropolitan centre, this important. That's why I ask people to go, because it feels to me like it's quite important the way it defines history. But otherwise, I, I send them into a main street, Velika Zhitomirska, or down to Podil, and I tell them to spend an hour, you will find a fantastic restaurant, and they always do. <laughs> Very nice. Have you been to Chernobyl? Um, so, hilariously, for all that I've been telling people, <laughs> the closest so far that I've got to it is um, through uh, 3D glasses. Oh, okay. Because there, is, uh, there was a contract with Salford University to provide the first ever comprehensive um, footage of Pripyat in the area, mm -hmm. which has never before been captured in that way. So I did, it kind of felt like I'd been there. But in fact, I'm going in, I think it's three weeks, 
three weeks' time for the first time, and I'm Great. really looking forward to it. I think uh, neither me nor Tatiana have been there. No, not yet. Have you not? Not yet. <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I'll let you know. No, but I have um, family friends, who, uh, family and friends who have both been there and have come back and talked about the extraordinariness of it. So it does feel like it's important to do. Sure. Uh, so I invite us to come to the blog on political questions and uh, the first question, uh, this is actually one of the most interesting parts so that our viewers uh, are always eager to know. The first question is about the Partnership for a Strong Ukraine Fund and I believe that Great Britain was among the initiators of this uh, um, uh, initiative. Uh, how does Britain see Ukraine um, as a strong country and um, can you announce the first steps uh, that will strengthen our country uh, with the help of our uh, British supporters uh, in uh, terms of this uh, initiative? Mm. So the Partnership for a, for a Strong Ukraine is, is um, a program which is dedicated to the east of the country. Mm -hmm. And the point of that program, which is the first of its kind in Ukraine, is that for nearly eight years now, the UK and many other countries have been reacting to the conflict. Humanitarian assistance, assistance for refugees, military support, and all this continues to be important. But the problem is that on the humanitarian and the development side, they're not helping change anything. You know, you create, for example, it's one of the most mined areas of the world. So you employ people to remove mines, but separatists are still laying mines. So you remove and they lay and you remove and they lay, and it's not changing. And similarly, as long as uh, refugees remain refugees, mm -hmm. because there is no peace and they can't return, you can't, you can't somehow change the balance of the situation. You're just dealing with a problem. It's like an endless problem. And there is a humanitarian prerogative to do that. But I wanted to do more than that. And my sense when I've travelled east, and I've been east now seven or eight times to different parts of the country, is that people who live there are frankly crying out for an ability to say what it is they want and to influence both policies and programming in such a way that it does change things and change things for their involvement. So this programme tries to do that. It's not yet live. I hope mm -hmm. and we plan that it will go live at the end of this year. So I can't yet talk about specific mm -hmm. projects, but what I do hope and expect it will do is engage with communities, with women and girls, with professional people, with young people who have left the region and would mm -hmm. like to return in terms of talking about the economic opportunities they want to see, what's most important to them in terms of security, how does one rebuild that, what do they think of the government's economic plan and what sort of support countries like the UK should be giving, giving them. That's the kind of um, programming uh, I'm hoping for us to do. And it excites me because if we can do that, then we're helping in a quite active way to enable citizens to try to transform things for themselves, even though the peace process hasn't yet yielded a peace. Mm -hmm. It's quite a risky, it's quite a brave thing, but it's quite an active, proactive thing for us to be doing. So we're going to expect it by the end of this year, probably? Should be live by the end mm -hmm. of the year. Okay, we'll follow the news. <laughs> Uh, the UK Minister uh, for European Neighbourhood in the Americas, Wendy Morton, visited Kiev. Um, she participated in the Crimean Platform uh, Summit mm -hmm. this summer together with the representatives of 46 countries. And she said that the UK was ready to support it and to ensure success of the Crimean Platform. Yeah. Madam Ambassador, in your opinion, what should be the format in which the world community will join the platform so that it transforms from just an instrument to keep Crimea on the world agenda to a real powerful lever to bring Russia to justice? Yeah, well, my hope is that it will do both, and they're both important. So uh, when um, Minister Chaparova first talked about the Crimea platform as a concept. To perform this platform, mm -hmm. we uh, finalized the concept of this platform within MFA. Now it goes through this discussion with the um, main stakeholders of the process, mm -hmm. giving the details as ah, it, yes, it is not yet years. confirmed. Um, it was very clear it was filling a gap. We were all, we've just talked about the resource that we're putting into Donbass, right? And the political process that is there for Donbass, but there isn't or wasn't one for Crimea. And in fact, the UK was the lead convener on Crimea until this platform idea came up. And uh, that was within my first year that I remember chairing a couple of conversations within which people would be grateful for the information, but not really know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Crimea platform, uh, 
does away with the assumption that there is nothing you can do about it. So beyond the resolutions and the debate that goes on in the UN, otherwise you think of it as something that is now, it's illegally annexed and therefore it has a different status from Donbass and that's it. It challenges that and I think it's right that Ukraine should want that challenge. And I think it's very exciting that this is Ukrainian led, shouldn't be led by anybody, any other country. It's for Ukraine to decide how to do this. So the very existence of it that reminds you that while you're thinking about the Donbass, you should also be thinking about Crimea in the same way with a structure for it. That's really important. What I then hope the uh, expert level conversation that will go on under each of the pillars will do will be to educate us all on exactly what is going on in Crimea, on the environment, on militarization, on human rights, on access, etc., okay. on the bleeding of that um, annexation into the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea. So that when we talk, so this is our job, when we talk about it in the UN or in the OSC or in other international, we can talk from a point of view as, uh, of hardcore intelligence and we can target our conversation away from the general Crimea is Ukraine, hashtag okay. Crimea is Ukraine, this is really bad, it's legal annexation, towards this is the effect of this annexation, this is what's going on ecologically, this is what's going on with people's rights, this is what's going on with militarization. And that means that tools that we have, like sanctions for example, uh -huh. can become even smarter because you can apply them to very specific scenarios. That's what I hope, and I believe that too is what the Ukrainian government is looking for, to be able to yield a stream of information so that we can then use the diplomatic tools that we've got to achieve much more of a focus uh -huh. on what the impact of this illegal annexation has been. Uh -huh. uh, further to this question, the Ukrainian party in the, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly promotes the idea of establishing the um, uh, groups uh, of, for, uh, for the Crimean platform uh, in uh, the parliaments of the Crimean platform mm -hmm. member states. Is it realistic to do so in the UK and do you support this idea? Well, I mean, it's up to the Ukrainian parliament how they how they, you know, put together their, their support across We the know that the representatives um, of Ukrainian parliament to the PA mm -hmm. uh, of NATO had a meeting with uh, uh, British uh, counterparts on that, on introducing those groups of support of Crimean platform into the British parliament. Well, I think that that collaboration, by the way, is really great mm -hmm. and really strong. Uh, and there is an active um, all-party parliamentary group for Ukraine, which has shown an interest in the Crimea platform, just as they have, of course, in the conflict in the East. So I would expect that it then becomes one of several issues mm -hmm. that the all-party parliamentary group pays attention to. Um, but I was aware of that first conversation and it's been very positive. I think they would then be waiting for advice mm -hmm. from the Ukrainian government. What is it then that um, parliamentarians around the world can do with the type of information that we've just been discussing? Mm -hmm. You once said that the issue of Ukraine's accession to NATO has been already resolved. That already resolved in principle. In principle. In principle. Yes. Thank you for this remark. Um, so far, we uh, see no like major changes uh, on our path uh, to NATO. Uh, Ukrainian side is keep saying that. Ukraine needs an MAP, but it seems like we don't have a consensus with our partners on it. What is the reason for that? Is that because uh, the dynamics of reforms in Ukraine are pretty low? Or is that because uh, of the likelihood of Russia's aggressive response to such an important political step uh, taken by the Allies? Mm. So first of all, I think I disagree that nothing has happened because Ukraine received Enhanced Opportunities Partnership last year. That was a really big step. Mm -hmm. When I first arrived, and I think I've said this in other interviews, when I first arrived in September 2019, the first advice I had was that Ukraine would not get Enhanced Opportunities Partnership. In February the following year, Ukraine got Enhanced Opportunities Partnership. I was one of the representatives that lobbied hard for that to happen. It was a really exciting moment when it did. It particularly showed that these things were possible, even when there were member countries in NATO who perhaps started out not supporting it. So that meant that there was a case to be made for each of these stages towards NATO accession. When I talked about the fact of this being resolved in principle, I was referring to the declaration of the last NATO summit and of previous NATO summits that made clear Ukraine will join NATO. And it meant, of course, there are steps towards it, but Ukraine is on, is on that path. What I've also said publicly and said to Ukrainian government and keep saying within um, conversations with um, colleagues in the Ministry of Defence is that for those who um, would like to see this take longer, the slow pace of defence reform is an open goal. 
So that work has to continue. And it's not a particularly attractive message because defence reform, just like judicial reform, which by the way is also required mm -hmm. as part of the steps towards NATO, these are difficult and there are huge vested interests in Ukraine, which I think we have seen fairly, fairly clearly, particularly in judicial reform, particularly in the last weeks and months, that um, when you start to really try to change things, those who don't want it changed work pretty hard to make sure that it doesn't happen. Or if you agree a law, then implementation just becomes too hard, right? It's, it's, it's a real struggle and it takes a long time and it's boring. It's not, it's not interesting, it's not pictorial, it's not work that's good for TV. You know, someone signs a paper or suddenly someone can get a promotion without having to pay something for it. These are not things that work well for, you know, visually for you. Whereas if you see uh, Ukrainian soldiers working alongside NATO troops and operating, that's really visual. Just the presence of Ukrainians there sends a big message. But the problem is both are important. And defence reform is moving too slowly. Mm -hmm. It's moving, but it's moving too slowly. The structural work that needs to be done to ensure that the Ministry of Defence and its attendant agencies can operate in a transparent way and in an agile way uh, and that judicial reform provides equally mm -hmm. for those elements of defence reform to make progress, these things are as important. And so, you know, the one thing I can do as a supporter and a real friend of Ukraine is A, to keep offering our support and advice for it, but B, to keep talking about it. I don't believe that these are being used as reasons for Ukraine not to join NATO. I'm afraid I do believe that this is work that, NATO, that Ukraine needs to do in order for Ukraine to progress along these, these different milestones um, towards event, eventual NATO membership. Speaking of reforms, I think that the question on the reforms is inevitable, especially as you are the chair of uh, the G7 uh, ambassador support group that we spoke before the interview. I wanted to ask about uh, the reform of the oligarchization and mm. under this uh, scandalous bill, uh, it um, uh, confuses the society. Uh, there is still no joint position in the society and even among the MPs. And it was uh, uh, such a great scandal that uh, even uh, served as a formal reason for the dismissal of Metro Rozumkov. So do you think that uh, the president and and the members of parliament uh, chose the right uh, tools to fight with the uh, oligarchs and uh, do you think that uh, what can be another uh, other um, efficient instruments in fighting mm -hmm. with the influence of oligarchs in that context well so i suppose i disagree on one point which is that there's no common position i think there is one common position held by parliamentarians at least in principle and certainly by people which is that something has to be done about oligarchs sure. yeah. that yeah. is the and that's the most the important thing right because um, for Ukraine, the gap very often is a legal one. And therefore, of course, it's inevitable mm -hmm. that there would be a legislation that will come forward on, uh, on um, oligarchs. And uh, what I commented on social media, which you will see if you checked, mm -hmm. is that that is a tool that can do its bit potentially, right, in principle, towards dealing with the issue. But in the end, it's not the only one. So this isn't an either or. This, mm -hmm. isn't, this can't be a conversation that says, well, that doesn't look like it's working. Let's try something else. You almost certainly do need a form of legislation, but it will only work, this is the same, frankly, for judicial reform or for banking reform or any reform, mm -hmm. if other things also happen. And those other things, there are so many of them, just for a few, you need a free independent media, you will know that as, as well as anybody, and you know that there is a dearth of that in this mm -hmm. country and that media can be instrumentalised here um, through private use. You need a liberalisation of the energy market, mm -hmm. you need anti-monopolist commission to be doing proper anti-monopoly job, you need uh, equal access to investment. You need judicial reform so that you know the uh, uh, foreign investors know that the the law isn't tilted um, towards those vested interests. All of these things and more you need um, because oligarch interests, of course, find their way through all those different systems. So, for me, the very fact that there was a political debate going on about these issues that for me was worth commenting on. That's why I took to social media. That for me inherently was a positive. But even the best law will not get you there mm -hmm. without all these other measures. Mm -hmm. So for me, the test is, will these other measures now get attention? Thank you. Excessive growth of power of president and presidential office and decision-making process in the country. Let's wait and see. Brexit um, is, a, is a quite big benefit. There are still people who think Ukraine is part of Russia. Have you ever faced the gender biases. Yes, I always have, my entire career. I'm not listening to that. I know what it is I want and I'm going to work towards it.